welcome to Conversations. Uh, before I introduce my guest, I want to tell a little bit about myself and why this all fits together. Um, my mother was born in Montana, uh, along with a lot of the family. I was born out on the coast during World War II, but uh, by the time I was four, moved back to Billings, so I think of myself as a Montanan. I've lived elsewhere, but come back. Um, one of the places I lived was in Chicago, where there was racism was so strong. Uh, there were places you weren't supposed to go, and where you weren't, didn't feel safe. And then, of course, I'm old enough to have lived through the days when you know whole cities caught fire over racial tension. And I was aware that up here in Montana, we think we're very tolerant, but we don't have any blacks really to be tolerant of. It's a very easy tolerance. And for quite some time, and I've become more and more aware of history of what happened to the Native American people in this country, and uh, and wanted to do something about it. And uh, just recently, I got thrown in with some people, and I thought this is a chance. And so I've asked Catrice Hammond to be on my show to uh, help me expose all my stupidities. Okay and to uh, maybe blow up some of those myths that we both might have about each other. Let's start with, I, I brought up where I was born. Where were you born? I was born in Fort Belknap. It's, um, the reservation is northeast, real close to the Canadian border. Um, it's directly in between Haver and Malta. It's easier to tell people between Haver and Malta because they usually know where, one or the other. No, I have no uh, idea. Okay. okay. <laughs> Um, that's about all. I mean, that's the only way to describe it. It's very flat, very cold, very nice, though. Now, I lived on a, a, a nice little lane, uh, dead-ended. Mm -hmm. Everybody was white. Uh, looked like a Norman Rockwell picture at Thanksgiving time. Mm -hmm. um, what about where you lived? I lived on the reservation, um, and on the reservation they have different, like, I don't know if you'd call them subdivisions or not, but there are different groups of housings in different areas. Um, first we lived um, this one part called Low Rent, which um, I guess you can compare it to the ghetto. The, I, I've never been to the ghetto, but what I've heard of it, like the bad parts. And then we moved to another subdivision. Um, called Newtown and it was on a street that wound around and we lived there and the people we lived with are by. We all kind of grew up together. Um, I don't know. Um, I never thought about it. I, I because everyone around me was white and we were so dominant you mm -hmm. know in the culture never thought about thinking about other people like that. Were, how were, being on the reservation, how aware were you when you were a young kid that there was another world out there? Or? Actually, I was always aware because Harlem, which is a little town. Harlem? Yeah, yeah. really? You I've don't know where? I've been there. Oh, wow. These people don't know where that is. Mm. Um, Harlem is only three miles away from Fort Belknap. Mm. And we went to school at, Fort, or at Harlem. Um, and I, I guess I didn't really experience any or notice anything because we all just grew up together and so we didn't really have much of a problem with each other if you're Indian or you're white or anything. Um, did you see it as a, as a world apart? I've become, since we started talking about doing this show, mm -hmm. I've, I've catch myself saying things and then rethinking them. And, and today I was saying something about the real world. As uh, people who lived on the reservation, that wasn't the real world. The real uh -huh. world was done here, and I thought, it's just as real on the reservation, I'll mm -hmm. bet, as it is down here. Um, was the reservation, and is the reservation, is that kind of a hometown, or what, do you feel a, a, an allegiance to that? Do you go back? Mm -hmm. uh, Definitely. Family still there? Yeah, most of my family actually I would say 90% of my family still lives on the reservation. And um, I guess I do feel. And there's kind of this, 
Well, I'm from the Fort Belknap Reservation, and there's, like, some of my friends are, like, from, there's Browning Reservation, there's a, uh, Rocky Boy Reservation, um, and I guess sometimes we kind of pretend, or we joke that our reservation is better, which n neither is necessarily better, but um, it's kind of a pride thing to say I'm from Fort Belknap, or in my mind, that's how it is anyway. Which leads to another question to a lot of us. Mm -hmm. There's just Indians. You know. mm -hmm. um, that's not exactly true. Not really. Okay. Well, I mean, you, you make distinctions, and I, I've, mm -hmm. when I was a teenager, I found out that some Indians hated other Indians, which came mm -hmm. as a real surprise to me. Some of them went back to how certain Indians treated the white people when they came. The Crows were real good scouts, and so they had a good, they kind of, as mm -hmm. I understand, got a good deal from the white people. And, mm -hmm. um, and they hated, other people hated them. And who hates who, or what, do you see, do you see all of these things together as Indians, or, or to what extent are they different, uh, different little countries, sort mm -hmm. of? Well, I, I guess I can't speak for all um, Indians. But like for me and like some people from Fort Belknap, I guess saying you're from, you think your reservation is the best. And you know, like I'm a Cinnaboyan. And even on the Fort Belknap reservation, there are two tribes. There's the Cinnaboyan tribe and the Grovon tribe. Well, because I'm a Cinnaboyan, then obviously I'm better than the Grovons, even though we're from the same reservation. So I think you get a lot of that. Um, and I guess it, it depends on which way you look at it. It could be healthy, or it could be very unhealthy, too. Mm -hmm. Something I only found out, oh, four or five years ago, is that you may think you're an Indian, but unless the federal government Thank agrees you. with that, mm -hmm. you're not going to get certain funds, you're not going to be treated. Mm -hmm. Would you care to talk about that a little bit? About how... Mm -hmm. The government decides. Well, that when were you first aware of this, and and do you have to sign up at a certain age, or if your parents are signed up, or you have to enroll. Um, I'm not sure. Well, I don't think I became aware until I had my own children, and then realizing that I had to take the steps to enroll them, and you have to make sure you have enough um, blood quantum of a certain tribe so your children can be enrolled. Like you need to be. Eight six or eight sixteenths, which would be one half or a fourth, a quarter, and I think all the all the reservations are different. I'm not positive, but like in, I think it's Oklahoma, you only have to be very little, have a little blood quantum, and you can be, they consider you Native American, but like at Fort Belknap, you have to be at least a quarter of your blood has to be certain. Grovon or Cinnaboyan or whatever. Where I grew up, you know, there was the mayor. I never met him, but I knew there was a mayor, and mm -hmm. I knew the president of the United States. I, I had a kind of fit into an order. Now, to what extent did you feel that, or are there other people within the tribe that uh, kind of shake that structure up a bit? Let's. Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely. Um, knew that we had a mayor because Harlem was so close and we went to school there and you know the president and all that kind of stuff you learn in school mm -hmm. but also we have on reservations you have tribal councils and it the the number of people on a tribal council varies but at Fort Belknap right now we have seven I believe and then you have your tribal council your tribal council president and then you have a vice president and then I don't know if you have a secretary or not. These were not authentic Indian political structures, mm -mm. these? I don't think so. I, I mean, because they're, they're kind of like, maybe not the mirror image, but they're similar to our, reg our government, like the United States government. Well, I know it's sometimes when water rights or things come into play and there's a lot mm -hmm. of money all of a sudden those councils can get very political and uh, mm -hmm. the politicking can get pretty nasty. Yeah. Um, what about some of the day-to-day -day life? For instance, uh, health care. 
you know, if you broke your leg on the reservation? Well, on the reservation, most reservations either have a clinic or a hospital that you can go to. Um, and there isn't a charge to go there. Um, as long as you're an enrolled member, and you don't even have to be an enrolled member of that tribe, um, as long as you're an enrolled member. But that's only on the reservation. And I would say, I don't know, about over 70% of the Native American population don't live on the reservations. They live in urban settings. And when you move to, when you move off the reservation, you are still covered by what they call contract care, which means that that hospital, like Fort Belknap Hospital, if I was to get sick and it was still within six months after I moved, then they would pay the hospital bill. Doesn't matter where I went to the hospital at. So above and beyond everything else, there's a large federal bureaucracy that mm -hmm. whatever life you have is also interwoven with past history of what was done and laws that were enacted and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, what about school? You said that you went into Harlem? Yes. Our, um, our high school and our elementary school was in Harlem, which was not on the reservation. Um, but on our reservation, they had a school in Hayes. Hayes is a little town farther. I don't know if they're north or what, but they're farther. They're about 30 miles away. They ha there was a school there, um, high school, elementary school. They also have the mission there. And then down the road the other way, there's Dotson School. But because we lived in Fort Belknap, and it was closer and easier for us to go to Harlem School, which was only three miles away. Let's see, where was I going with this? I had a great question <laughs> asking for you. Oh, I wanted, to, yeah, I wanted to talk about this thing of coming in and off the reservation. Uh, I assume there are people who live their lives, have, you know, nice homes. Uh, on the reservation? On the reservation. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe farms and... It's possible, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also aware that uh, people grow up, they want to see, you know, go off the reservation to check things out. And I, I know people who are going up to the reservation or, you know, mm -hmm. if nothing else, to buy cheap cigarettes, you know. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> what, uh, can you talk to me a little bit about that, about uh, <coughs> what it's like living in both. You don't live on the reservation anymore, do you? No, I live here in Missoula. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you go back because you have family there? Mm-hmm. So it, it's... And I go back to see the down. doctor and go to the dentist. Ah, mm -hmm. for the health care that's yeah. still there. We should throw in what you do here in town. I met you through... Through the Missoula Indian Center. Um, we are located at 2300... It's the time to use your camera. <laughs> Do I have to? No, no. not really. <laughs> We're located at 2300 Regent Street. I'd rather look at you because that looks funny. Okay. Um, the Missoula Indian Center has been in Missoula um, as a nonprofit nonprofit corporation since 1970. We offer, it's basically an outreach and referral. Like our health programs, we have... Um, a diabetes program, we have a health promotion disease prevention program, we also have um, counseling testing and referral which is like HIV. Mm. We have mental health um, services available. What else do we have? My mind just went blank so I don't even remember what else we have. We do have an outpatient chemical dependency program and then most of our clients come in for like, the food bank comes to the Indian Center when, every Wednesday, and so they come for that, and then the phone. A lot of people in our lobby, we have a phone, and they just use the phone, and that's a way for them to call back home to their families and their friends or do everyday business. Computer access, do they? They don't have computer access yet. However, we did receive um, a computer from the National Minority AIDS Council. Does that sound right? Yeah. Anyway, from them, they gave us a computer for our clients to use to access different um, information about HIV, STDs, and AIDS. 
um, hepatitis C. And we decided that we would just let, they can use it for that too, but if they also needed to just type up a resume or whatever, they can use it that way too. We don't have that yet. We do have the computer, it's just not hooked up yet. Does the Indian Center do any work with uh, people coming to town, getting lost, not just physically, but you know, drunk and wanting to get back to the reservation and needing some kind of counseling or, you know? Yeah, we have, um, we do a lot of public service is that what it would be called, public service? Mm -hmm. Community service? I don't know what you would call it. <coughs> but um, not necessarily always helping them, um, because we, it all depends on our funds, too, how much funds we have and all that stuff. But we do offer and provide help for people who need it, like if, they need, like if there was a death in their family and they needed to get home, then we can help them do that. Um, or if they just needed to go to the doctor, back home, we can help them do that. But one of the things we like to do is refer people to either Partnership Health Center or St. Ignatius because they do have a clinic up there and it's not too far. Um, they offer dental and you can also get your prescriptions there. And we have a van that we drive people there too. So that kind of saves people, in case they don't have a car or something, then we can drive them there for those kind of services. We talked a bit about the reservation, but there are also urban centers or mm -hmm. is are you one of those or does that we are considered an urban center yes and there are five in montana actually there's one in missoula there's one in butte one in helena great falls ha where's the other one i don't know there's i one don't more. know but are you <coughs> are you an urban center because you have a building and something set up or is there a special sort of structure <coughs> for urban centers does, are you following me there we are an urban center because we have a building and we're set there, and we also because that, I'm not sure if there was some kind of, um, do you mean like if there was some kind of policy or something that? Well, I mean, would you, be an, it, would you be an urban center if you didn't have the Indian center? I mean, is there kind of a governmental, I know that. Well, actually, urban center and Indian center are pretty much the same thing, only we're not on the reservation, we're off the reservation. And basically, I think, I believe, I don't know for sure, but I think we are an urban center because we're not on the reservation, but we still offer those kind of services. I guess it was to in Indian. HIV work, there's a money allotted to tribes and there's money allotted to the urban mm -hmm. centers. And I guess what I was sort of fishing for was whether those really had a kind of political real, real identity or they became one when they was the center there. I think we became one when we got there, um, because the tribes are definitely, you know, on the reservations. But the urban centers, the way I understand it, they were developed, or whatever, um, because there were people moving off the reservations that still needed services, and they needed a place to be able to go, just even to just a place to meet and talk, but to like to practice their culture and meet other people who do the same thing. And so that's why they developed urban centers. <coughs> is there, a, probably there is and there isn't, and it varies from person to person, but is mm -hmm. there kind of a, for lack of a better term, Indian underground? I mean, if someone comes from the reservation to the city and he meets people and, you know, gets clued in on how things work. And I think so. Um, but not, not necessarily as fast or, like, am I moving too much? I usually talk a lot with my hands, and I'm trying not to. Oh. Um, I don't know, and that's always a thing we're trying to figure out is how we can get the word out that we are there. We're, we're here, the Indian Center is here and has been for 30 years, and a lot of people don't even know that we exist. And so a way for us to be able to let other people know, especially other Indians that are coming to Missoula, that we're here. We haven't figured it out yet, but I guess, actually word of mouth, I think, is the best way. Like some other Indian said, why don't you go to the Indian Center and do this? And then that's usually how people come to us. Well, I didn't know where you were. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've sat in committees with you and things like that, and it's referred to the Indian Center, but I wasn't, <coughs> I was vaguely aware of mm -hmm. where it was, and that was it. 
Um, I want to talk about some of those stereotypes and myths that kind of lie under the skin. You don't really think about them. I, as a white person, don't think about them. Mm -hmm. um, my dad was an auto mechanic, and he always talked about Indian cars. He didn't like to work on Indian cars because he said they were <laughs> dirty. I said that to you the other day, and what did you say? <laughs> An Indian car isn't an Indian car because it's dirty. It's an Indian car because it doesn't always run. And okay. because you have, like, a, a clothes hanger for your antenna or, you know, it's, that's what we consider an Indian car. So my dad probably mm -hmm. didn't see that many real, real <laughs> Indian cars. He didn't see cars. real Indian cars, yeah. Um, dirty. You look pretty clean. I am clean, yes. Drunken. I, let me, I, I worked at the Oxford here for years, and I, mm -hmm. there, I remember one particular night where someone came in, an and Indian, and who was drunk, and I said, oh, God, another drunk Indian. And I just caught myself, because I looked around the room, and there were lots of sober Indians. Mm -hmm. And if it had been a white person drunk, I wouldn't say, oh, another drunken white man. Another drunken white man. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's like I had this stereotype, and if they fit into it, in fact, almost, I, I don't really think of Indians as a different race. It's only when they stand out to me when they fit a kind of stereotype, and then I mm -hmm. kind of shift into it. I think maybe it's probably people do with gay people. It's like, you know, don't mm -hmm. even realize they're gay until they start acting gay, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, but what's that like? Yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but the alcohol is, and it is a problem, isn't it? It is a problem, but I don't know that it's much more of a problem than it is for any other race. I don't have any. As a full-blown alcoholic that. myself, yeah. I, I'm not one to be casting uh -huh. stones. But uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. there is that stereotype. There that, is. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know. I thought about that because when. We were talking, Debbie and I were talking about when I was going to come and visit mm -hmm. with you today. How would I respond to things like that? And my first impulse was to say, well, I would say, well, hello. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess the more I thought about it, I guess it's how you react and how other people, like if I was in a bar drinking, and somebody called me a drunk Indian, I guess then it's how I react to that. And some people don't react as well as others, and it gets <coughs> tiresome, and it isn't fair and all that, but that's just how it is. And it's not okay, and I'm not trying to say it's okay, but it happens. Um, <coughs> <coughs> there is, <coughs> excuse me, could read. There is this kind of mild-mannered racism that I've been talking about, mm -hmm. you know, that's just sort of more stupid than anything else, or unaware. What about full-scale nastiness? I mean, uh, is there a point at which Indians really become victims of physical abuse and crimes and... I think so, definitely. And one... <coughs> And I guess there's probably others, but one that really hits close ho to home. And can I mention it? Mm -hmm. um, my friend, and she's from Fort Belknap, her name was Mina Limpy. And she was stabbed by a white girl at the Stockman Bar. And it went on and on and on forever, and nothing ever happened to her, the girl. And I don't remember her name. It's like, oh, I don't want to say her name because it might not be her name. It might be the prosecutor's name or somebody. I think well, just leave it as, as, yeah. a, as, a, as a white girl's and, uh, incident in the bar. Um, and so nothing happened to her at all. I guess she was on probation or something. And it didn't even go to court for like over a year. And I guess that was the first time that I realized, and I've always grown up knowing that things aren't fair and it's unrealistic to think that, but how blatantly unfair and how, to me it seemed blatantly, and maybe not to other people, but to me it seemed real blatantly unfair that I, I don't even remember what she got because I was just so upset. I must have pissed off. 
Um, it was pretty light, if I remember, if she got yeah. and anything at all. That was, I guess, one of the, not the first time, but one of the first times where it hit so close to home and so, so close to somebody that I knew. And so I guess it does happen, and I guess it doesn't happen anymore to Native Americans than it does to any other race. But you notice more when you're Native American, and it happens to somebody right. who else who was an Indian. Mm -hmm. My grandmother always talked to, I don't know why it would come up, she'd talk about it. The day they threw the three Indians over the cliff, this was down at Hardin, and uh, she never explained why they threw them over the cliff or mm -hmm. anything like that, but uh, certainly in earlier times. Um, well, let's go to those horrible, I don't know, the atrocities uh, mm -hmm. that had been committed. As I say, my grandfather was six when the news came through that Custer had been massacred. Mm -hmm. and they were living in Iowa, so it wasn't unrealistic that somehow Indians might come swooping down and do them all in in their beds. Mm -hmm. uh, that has changed so much, even from when I was younger. There's been a whole re-looking at all those things and what has been done. But the real atrocities that white people have perpetrated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't say I feel guilty, but yet on the other hand, if, I, if my grandfather could remember the Custer Massacre, then, then, then Indian people who were my age had grandparents who were involved in some of these shady goings on. And it mm -hmm. must be, I, I can afford to be kind of, well, it's, it's all dead and gone, but if, if it was your grandfather mm -hmm. and there was a massacre and he was killed and blah, blah, What's your take on that? Just personal, because I know it okay. varies. I, before you do, I, I say I, I have an older Indian friend who told me that until she was into her late 20s, she hated all white men. Mm -hmm. Blew me away, because as I say, well, uh, so I'm going to ask you mm -hmm. what your feelings are <laughs> about that. After I talk about this? Um, I guess, since I'm a lot younger than you, I'm just kidding, not a lot. Everybody's <laughs> a lot younger than I. I, and I don't remember my grandparents talking about that, um, or maybe I just wasn't paying attention when they did. But now that I'm older and I think about it, I think about a lot of things, like how, okay, one thing about putting Indians on reservations, okay, which happened and it wasn't, always, it wasn't necessarily a good thing. I mean, actually, it wasn't a good thing. But my thought was, well, if they were going to do that, how come they couldn't let the Indians decide where they want their reservation then? If they were going to force them to be on a reservation and force them to be in this particular spot and stay in that spot, why couldn't they let them choose which spot they wanted to be in? Well, they were the, what, the Omaha? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, tribes in, uh -huh. in uh, Oklahoma that were forced to go all the way to Florida. It's called mm -hmm. the Trail of Tears, Tears I believe. Mm -hmm. and, um, but there's just a lot of things like that. And I I guess this is, would be a good part where if Debbie was here, because she could throw all kinds of crap at you. But <laughs> <laughs> and would. Uh -huh. I just, I never really thought of it. And maybe because I didn't really pay attention to or as much attention to my culture, to my grandparents, as I should have growing up. And now that I'm grown, I'm trying to learn more, because I don't really know a lot. That's interesting that... Mm -hmm. And I think that's another sad thing, because had we been allowed to just keep on living the way we were living, then maybe someone my age would know more about their culture and their traditions. And maybe not, I don't know. Well, for those who aren't aware, there was a real, Indians, in many cases, were forced, were forbidden to speak their own language. Mm -hmm. They were sent to schools. They were beaten if they spoke their native. Mm -hmm. The whole idea was to, you know, if you couldn't wipe out the Indians, then wipe out the culture. Mm -hmm. And they would be good little Christians in one generation. And uh, didn't work that way, but uh, left tremendous emotional scars on. Yeah, my dad went to um, Catholic school growing up, and it was awful. He tells horror stories all the time. Like what? Well, just that they didn't get to, say, talk their own language, and 
they were forced to wear certain clothes and they couldn't act. They had to cut their hair a certain way. Um, he always tells other ones too, so like he had to haul water two miles to take a shower. But that has nothing to do with being yeah. Indian. Um, I've seen some of those pictures of, of school, you know, the class or something or other, and these poor little Indian kids who look so mm -hmm. scared and their hair is all cut short mm -hmm. and they look, whoa, where yeah. am I and how did I get here? Mm -hmm. And this was at a time, this, these were not orphan children. Mm -hmm. They were taken away from their parents yep. and, and shipped off to these schools. Schools, yep, boarding schools. Mm -hmm. And then there's the corruption of the agents who administered the federal funds. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that isn't bad enough, the federal government itself would decide which treaties to validate to and which one. Which and, mm -hmm. and would decide that a treaty was valid when tribal custom was such that a certain number of people would be required and mm -hmm. they'd get two or three that together. And yeah. I guess, what, what do we do with that past? I, th I definitely think white people should be much more, uh, made more aware of it. That's mm -hmm. one thing I want to do is to say, hey, this happened. And uh, on the other hand, should you, you say that you're not as aware of it as you could be, mm -hmm. uh, then maybe young Native American kids could be made more aware of it. Mm -hmm. And then we can help other people be aware, maybe. Is there a movement to bring some of the language, culture back? Or is it slipping away on uh, native speakers more or less than there were before? A movement. Um, I don't know if there's a movement, but they definitely have um, programs like Title IX or Seven, Nine, And those are for like bilingual education. So yeah. we can learn our languages. The problem with that is finding someone to teach that language. Because of a lot of our elders, they don't write things down. I mean, if you want to learn it, you need to be there with them and learn it. And you can't write it down. Because I know my um, Uncle Mike learned a lot from my grandpa, whose name was Ira, and because he lived with him. He went to live with him and he learned the Assiniboine ways. I think it's Assiniboine. And um, a lot of our elders who have all this knowledge and stuff, they don't write it down, and they don't believe in writing it down. And so part of that is, I guess, the interest of the younger generations, we don't, I guess we aren't taking the interest, and we're not taking the opportunity to go with our elders and learn like we should. Well, I was watching that documentary I told you about that I've been going through. The certain children who, at an early age, showed a real gift for memory, mm -hmm. were picked out to remember the story. So. I mean, there's a, a reason for not writing it down. I mean, mm -hmm. it's part of a whole tradition of tradition. keeping it Passing an oral it mm -hmm. uh, tradition. I want to go to other stereotypes. Okay. There, there's the bad ones, but then there's the, uh, in the 18, 1700s and early 1800s, there was a whole school of low, the poor Indian, and the noble savage, and this kind of Indians were all pure and wonderful, and they represented a kind of uh, purity and goodness that, uh, you know, white men would never achieve. Uh, is that going a little bit far the other way? No, that's not a stereotype. That's all true. That's all true? No. <laughs> um, I, I guess it's just like with any other race. You have to find the medium. And I guess sometimes we tend to focus so much on the bad stuff and then I don't know. I want to say it's been like the bad stuff for so long that some people, and I don't know who decided to start saying the really, really nice stuff, which isn't realistic, like we're all pure and stuff, to make themselves feel better for saying or believing that other cr stuff. I almost said crap. I don't know what you can say you on can TV. You can say crap. We, okay. uh, I won't even tell you what we said last week. Okay. <laughs> the other crap, then. Yeah. Um, I don't know, what was your question now? I got lost. Oh, the, the noble savage, oh, the noble red man, the mm -hmm. last of the Mohicans, the 
way of life, you know, the kind of almost oversimplification mm -hmm. and over-identification with, mm -hmm. with the Indian as a great warrior and hunter. And I think, though, at the time before we were forced to be on reservations, it was like that, maybe not that, because we still warred, had wars against other tribes. Um, so there was still some of that not so good stuff. But I think because we were really good hunters, um, we would hunt in the summer times and like just eat and eat and feast. They <coughs> called it feast and famine, feast in the summer <coughs> and then famine in the winter when there wasn't any um, animals around. Um. So part of it, it's, it's not totally untrue, but it's not just totally that way either. One thing I hadn't thought about but was impressed with in this documentary was it's a way of life in which everybody has to participate to make it work. Mm -hmm. So there's bound to be certain values that, that are commendable, you know, loyalty and, mm -hmm. and communication and, and working together and all of that, uh, just out of sheer necessity. Um, powwows. Mm -hmm. I've never gone to a powwow because I always figured the powwows would be what Indians put on to amuse the white people, and I wasn't going to. That's not and I wasn't going to go and buy my <laughs> balloons or whatever uh -huh. it was that they were going. They were selling uh -huh. that particular day. Um, powwows are open to white people, mm -hmm. but it's not what we do to amuse the white people. Right. It's a way of getting together and celebrating who we are. Um, basically through dancing and through singing. And are those dances and, and songs, are they, are they really traditional, I guess? Is well, I guess with anything else, it's, you kind of lose a lot of the traditions as more generations. But basically, they are traditions. And um, like an honor song for the Blackfeet Indians, are, it's not exactly the same as an honor song for the Assiniboines. So it's different tribal traditions. But if I went to a powwow, I would see something that was quote unquote authentic Indian. I could uh -huh. catch some of the flavor. Yep, definitely. I will try to go. <laughs> They're having Kayo powwow at the university this, not this weekend, but next weekend. I'm going out of town this weekend, Wait. but maybe you can get that. <laughs> um, what you have to do? wind this up mm -hmm. pretty soon. It's been so much fun, but I want to talk a little bit about what we do about some of these things. Mm -hmm. I think it's great that you and I have met, and, and Debbie and uh, Brant, and we've all worked together, and it's like we've kicked some of this around. In fact, we were trying to plan a mm -hmm. conference where Indians, say, and gay white men could come together. and um, it's, There was a time for identity politics a while back where you were gay and you had to vote gay and you were Indian and you had to support da da and you were feminist and sometimes it got confusing. Mm -hmm. I think it's time now to build those alliances and to, you know, I, as a gay leader, and I guess I am, I, I would like to see this kind of thing that we're doing right now happen so that we could, you know, know what's going on so maybe we can support uh, uh, well, for in instance, HIV is a big question here, mm -hmm. and uh, gay Indians are not necessarily welcome on the reservation, but they're not really necessarily mm -hmm. th th welcomed among the white population. And then you throw HIV in the mix, and some of these people uh -huh. have no place Nowhere to go. To go. Yeah, it wasn't like that though. Way back when, um, if you were gay, or they I think they called it two spirited, you were honored in a tribe, and I don't know when that shame came. I've heard it came when, like, white people said it was shameful to be gay, so then Indian people started thinking it was shameful to be gay. That's what I heard, but I don't know. But I know it used to be an, they used to have positions of honor in a tribe. There's so much I could ask you. I want to, <laughs> okay, place of women in, in your particular tribe, uh -huh. strong. Very strong. Um, the woman was probably, I don't know, you know how a man is like the most important person in, I don't know, whatever tribe or whatever culture, then 
for the Assiniboines, women are very important. Although we do have rules or customs we're supposed to follow. Like. Like. Um, Let's just say that they're very important. How's that? <laughs> oh, okay. that <laughs> it's true. not anything really bad or anything. But. Okay, before we wind up, I want to go ahead into one mm -hmm. more area, and that's Indian spirituality. Just like the powwows, I sort of assumed that, oh, Indian spirituality was, you know, oh, that it had all gone, you know, that that was the days back when, when Black Elk spoke and that that tradition is long and gone and that the Indians were just sort of I don't know, trying to find a new identity by reviving uh, something that, you know, had already passed away. How about that? Can you speak to that uh, at all? I mean, nominally, a lot of people, are Indians are Christian. I would say, yeah. Uh, Catholics yeah. did a pretty good job. Yeah, they did. Uh, to what extent is that underlying Native spirit spirituality is still there, is it? I think the, the Native American spiritual, spirituality um, has always been there, even when they were going to Catholic schools and being forced to practice Catholic ways. Um, and it's not necessarily that now or after all that happened that Indians are trying to, I don't know, revitalize or re-identify with it. It's always been there. It's just that now they can more openly practice. It doesn't have to be this secret thing where you might get in trouble if you do it. Although if you're caught with peyote, it's still... Yeah, it's still against the law. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, for those who don't know, peyote is a much, no, cactus. Cactus. That can get you very high. Uh -huh. And uh, was used sacramentally and religiously mm -hmm. by tribes all across the western part of America. And mm -hmm. at various times, the federal government has stepped in and, and said, "You can't said, do that." Oh, this is a drug. You're hallucinating. None of that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Drink your wine, you know, but <laughs> if you're yeah. a Catholic, but don't uh, touch those cactus. Mm. But I believe that the spirituality is like one of the strongest things. One of the what do you call that? The foundations that keeps people grounded, Native Americans being able to say, I'm Native American, and finding their spirituality and finding themselves and finding their way back to that, I think. I don't know if other people think that, but that's what I think. Catrice, uh, this is kind of an arbitrary. We could talk lots more. And yep. <laughs> this has been fun. Uh, I'd love mm -hmm. to have other Native Americans, other Indians mm -hmm. on. Uh, representing different points of view. It's that would be good because kind of somebody a cause might know a lot that I more. think uh, I'm going to take up and it'll be mm -hmm. much more interesting for a while than HIV. Yeah, and somebody else might know a lot more than I do. Yeah. Uh -huh. One of those elders maybe. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Are we done? Yeah we're done. Okay.